Good evening, everyone. <clears throat> My name is Mike Wohler, and I am pleased to represent the Chatham Historical Society as chair of the Board of Trustees. And on behalf of the board and our honorary trustees, I wanna welcome you to the 2021 annual meeting. I believe we have an exciting program for you this evening, and I hope that you find it both informative as well as entertaining. I would like to begin by thanking our donors, our sponsors, our volunteers, our employees for their contributions, both financial and in terms of the time that they have donated to the society. Without that continued support, we might be talking about some different issues at this meeting, but I sincerely thank you for your support. It's been an interesting and challenging 18 months um, we're not out of the woods yet, but I think we've done some good things. We have focused our efforts, our operating plan, in four very short-term areas. Number one, strengthening our financials, focusing on memberships, donors, grants, to make sure that we can offer the services that we want. Increasing our technology competence. This has forced us to become more virtual and we need the remote capability <clears throat> to be able to do that. Expanding our outreach on lecture series and networks, and also improving our infrastructure, not only the museum itself and the storage, but also the staff. And I think we've made some very good progress in these four areas during the past year, and we will continue to focus on those four areas going forward. You'll hear about some of these during the business segment. But for now, I would like to turn the program over to Kevin Wright, our executive director, and thank you again. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate the kind words. Uh, welcome everybody to our uh, annual meeting for 2021. Uh, as Mike said, I am the executive director of the Atwood Museum, uh, and we're very glad that you could join us today. Uh, pretty much, this is going to be a virtual uh, format, as you can as you can tell. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure that most of us are uh, are zoomed out by now, but uh, the good news is that we're all becoming Zoom experts, so uh, that's always an exciting thing. Um, for all of uh, everybody who's in attendance who are members, uh, we encourage you to vote. There'll be different prompts throughout this uh, business section of the uh, meeting uh, that you'll be able to click and and vote. Uh, you'll see it in a poll. It will either say yes, no, or abstain. So please. Uh, Check those when those are uh, they're coming up, uh, and then after the uh, the keynote address uh, by our guest speaker, there will be a Q and A uh, period that you can uh, ask questions to. Um, there's a section in there on the bottom of your Zoom screen for Q and A. So any questions you have, please feel free to write them in, uh, either during his talk, right after his talk, uh, and we'll get to as many as we can, time allotted. Um, the other thing I want to talk to you about is, uh, you know, our, our committee report. Most of the information uh, that uh, about our um, about the historical society is on our website. If you go onto the website at ChathamHistoricalSociety.org uh, and look under the annual meeting page, you will find our treasurer's reports, our governance and nominating reports, the minutes from 2020, and our current bylaws. Um, and those are all things that uh, are available to you on our website. Um, so for now, I'm going to um, turn it back over to Mr. Waller, uh, and we'll talk to us about our, uh, the minutes. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. I would like to have a motion to waive the, the reading of the minutes. As Kevin said, they are on the website, and also uh, to approve the minutes of 2020. And if we could go to a vote, I would appreciate it. We'll be coming shortly. Okay. Mike, we'll have to go on from that one, okay? Okay, um, very good. 
technical okay. problems on that particular one. Sorry. Okay, that's fine. Um, with that, I would like to turn uh, the, the program over to Linda Sabula, our treasurer. And Linda, yep. Good evening. I'm assuming you can all hear me? Yep, you're on. Okay, great. The treasurer's report is available on the society's website, as Kevin just said. If anyone would like a copy of our financial statement and our tax returns, please contact the office directly and we'll arrange to have them sent to you. 2020 was quite the year for us. With the pandemic and the ceasing of operations for most of the year, we were still able to have summer visitors and events while maintaining safety protocols. Though revenues for the gift shop and admissions were significantly lower than both budget and 2019, we were still able to provide public access to our museum. The generosity of our donors and supporters was evident in the result of our fundraiser evening to remember for $75,000. It was a completely virtual event. This plus the federal payroll program enabled us to ride out the pandemic and meet our financial obligations. We have received forgiveness on the payroll loan for the full $20,800. The virtual world provided new ways for us as executive director Kevin Wright and staff continued to provide virtual lectures and music for our community. Admissions and event tickets were available through internet programs and continue to be available through internet programs. Unfortunately, children's programming was again not able to be held this summer, but we hope to be able to provide this for 2022. So overall, while we experienced reductions in our revenue streams, we expect to weather these uncertain times and continue to provide programming for our community. Thanks to our board members who have worked to raise additional funds and to our staff and volunteers who have, as always, gotten it done no matter the challenges. And again, many thanks to the generosity of our supporters. Kevin, do you have the tally for the... Yeah, I think they're still coming in slightly, but right now it's been 100% approved. Okay. Um, so I think we're good. Okay, very good. And I would like to now introduce Steve Burlingame, who is going to handle the election of officers and the election of new trustees and a reappointment of trustees. Steve? Am I in view? No, you need to hit on your uh, start your video. There I go. On behalf of the um, the nominating and governing committee, I would present um, the following as uh, their recommendation as officers uh, of the board of directors. The chair to be Michael Bola, vice chair, Steve Nickerson, treasurer, Linda Sabula, and secretary, Amanda Davis. You will soon see a poll. It looks like we have 100% approval there, Steve. Great job. Thank you, Kevin. Um, as a proposed slate of new trustees, 
would be Mariah Kelly, the class of 2025, Carolyn Levy, the class of 2025, Winnie Lear, class of 2022, and Bonnie Rosenthal, the class of 24. Again, you will see a poll on your screen. Again, we have 100% uh, uh, approval on that, Steve. Thank you, Kevin. And finally, uh, the re-election of trustees, Nick Harris, the class of 2025, and Craig Vokey, the class of 2025. And finally, you will see one last poll. And we have 100% approval for them as well. That's great. Thank you for your support. Um, I'll introduce Mark, Mike Waller again, um, who will introduce all of the board members. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, I would like to acknowledge them by reading the name of the trustees, Don Boyton, Steve Burlingame, Stuart Green, Mariah Kelly, Winnie Lear, Carolyn Levy, Ginny Nickerson, Jamie Seldorf, Bonnie Rosenthal, Angie Simons, Craig Volke, and our recording secretary, Margaret Martin, and our honorary trustees, Rob Berg, Stephen Daniel, Donna Drown, Marianne Eldred, Bill Litchfield, Janet Margolay, Barbara Matson, Stefania McLennan, Walter Meyer, Joshua Nickerson, Chris Reinsmith, John Whalen, and Sarah Wilst Wilsterman. Back to Kevin. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, so um, I, I just want to going to share my screen uh, and talk about the museum a little bit here. Uh, so yeah, we're um, uh, very excited and I'm very excited to be the executive director for such a very uh, thriving uh, museum that we have here. Uh, at, at the Atwood. Um, I, I, just before we uh, we came onto our Zoom this afternoon, uh, we were literally bombarded with a whole bunch of visitors that came. Uh, that's what we tend to get on a very uh, rainy day. Uh, in, the, in the past, we've had some really uh, big crowds. This year has been incredibly uh, busy. Uh, we hit close to 150 folks a couple of weeks ago, and we had 87 visitors show up today. So it's... Um, uh, been a very uh, hopping place here at the Atwood, to say the least. Um, as I just go through uh, a few of the things that we got going on, if you have uh, been to our museum in the last couple of years, you'll notice that our exhibits, for the most part, are the same for our 2021 as they were for last year. Our, our goal was to hopefully reduce some of the exhibits uh, for 2021, but due to COVID, we had to put that on hold a little bit, but we do have some wonderful exhibits returning, uh, including the Turning Point, which talks about the uh, 400th anniversary, or as we like to joke, the 400th and one anniversary of the Turning Point and the Mayflower's journey to uh, the new world. Uh, we also have, uh, if you've been to our museum out in the parking lot by uh, next to the Fresnel lens, uh, the wonderful We Too that was built by David Whedon, uh, that is, up and people have uh, had the opportunity to go in and see it. Uh, we look forward to using this over the next several years. Hopefully we'll be doing a lot of educational opportunities in it, uh, but it's a great new addition uh, to our museum and we're very uh, grateful to have that. 
Um, also, again, this is the uh, second year of our uh, Remembering Our Heroes, the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II. Uh, this is a fun exhibit. Uh, and this will be its last year uh, in this room, is, uh, in this uh, museum as well, um, as we have a whole bunch of new exhibits planned uh, for 2022. Uh, I, I couldn't, uh, I wanted to mention our costume and textiles chair, Janet Marjolet, who is uh, really instrumental in putting a lot of the costumes that you see within the museum. Uh, every year she does a, a great job of decorating the music room within the, uh, uh, the Joseph Atwood house. Uh, this year he, she did uh, christening dresses uh, and uh, uh, it's just, she just does a wonderful job and we get a lot of compliments and comments from uh, our visitors uh, that come to the museum. So thank you, Janet, for that. Uh, we were very fortunate uh, to have a, a great uh, school groups come to the museum this year. I believe we had uh, over 100 students show up um, and we, we welcomed them. We had some wonderful docents and volunteers come in and take them through the museum. Uh, and uh, I believe we had uh, four different uh, bus tours of groups of kids of that day. So uh, this is the kind of stuff that we really want to focus on uh, for 2022 and beyond. Uh, we had hoped to have a, um, a summer program for our kids. It didn't work out quite well this year uh, as much as we'd like to, but we are working on plans to uh, work things through and hopefully COVID will be, be behind us and uh, uh, we will have that. So stay tuned for that because uh, that's a real a big part of our program plans for the future. We always have a lot of events. One thing that's sort of interesting, we've now are, are uh, tapping into the private events. Uh, we've had a couple of uh, weddings and pre-wedding events at the museum. As you can see by some of the pictures here, we uh, had some really nice decorations and uh, a lot of people. So it's an extra revenue source that we have at the museum, plus it's a fun event. Uh, and uh, it's a lot of work uh, because we're dealing with literally a staff of three and we're really dependent on, on uh, the volunteers <clears throat> that we have at the museum to help us. But all in all, uh, we're getting a lot of people interested. Uh, we have a lot more information on our website. So if you have a private event that you're interested in doing at the museum, please check out our uh, section on our website and get in touch with, with us. Uh, between myself and uh, John Tibbetts, my assistant director, uh, we'll make things happen well for you. So. Uh, History Week in this year, uh, this is the collaboration with uh, Historic Chatham. Uh, our part, we did some wonderful things with Hannah Carlson and, and Don Broderick, who uh, dressed up uh, as pilgrims and, and welcomed everybody. We had a book signing of one of Hannah's books. Uh, so it was a fun weekend. Uh, we like to say it was the official kickoff of our, our summer season, but we literally started in the beginning of May this year. So, uh, and, and things have been going well. Uh, Pirates Day we had uh, at the end of July. Uh, this has been ongoing for uh, three or four years. It's a fun family event. Uh, so uh, uh, they come up all dressed in their, their garb and kids enjoy all the kind of stuff. So it's a, it's a fun event and uh, we look forward to more events similar to this in the future. One of our favorite events that we have still coming up in October is called Halloween at the Batwood. Uh, Two years ago, we started it. We had over 200 kids come and parade through the museum with costume. Uh, and as you can see last year, it was scaled back a little bit only because of COVID, uh, and, but kids still dressed up uh, and uh, they have a wonderful time. And we have great volunteers who, who dress up and enjoy the trick or treating. So we're looking forward to that uh, coming in October. Always holidays at the Atwood is, is a fun time. Uh, we'll be having our best bake sale uh, in, the his, in history coming up in November. It's the Tuesday before Thanksgiving. Uh, so mark your calendar for that. We'll have events on that listed. Uh, we've also, last year, we brought back some new trains uh, that um, we used to have the trains of Ryder Martin. Uh, Ryder's no longer doing that right now, but uh, we have found some other, uh, another train set uh, and display that we have at the museum. So we will be having that through the month of December. So cheap, please check your calendar for that. Uh, we'll be in discussion uh, about the, the Grub with the Grinch. It's always a very popular event 
with the kids and we'll make sure we see how that works. And as you can see, the sleigh that we have in our antique tool room, we use that sleigh for stuff a sleigh uh, that we can donate uh, hats and gloves and mittens. And it's a, it's a wonderful event to uh, uh, raise uh, funds and uh, warm clothes for the children in, in need. So uh, please keep an eye on that as we'll do that in November and December as well. Uh, finally, I wanna uh, mention our, our annual gala in the evening to remember. This is coming up on the 28th, which is a week from Saturday uh, from five to 7.30. Again, it's at the wonderful home of Jamie and John Seldorf uh, at Sea La Vie. Uh, it's a beautiful location. Um, I will tell you that we, uh, I wanted to make, make sure everybody understands that uh, we, there's a lot of people and it's not a lot of great parking over there because it's a, it's a neighborhood. So if you are planning to come, uh, please see if you can make arrangements uh, to carpool. It will help uh, the whole event uh, and it will keep uh, Jamie's neighbors uh, happy uh, through this event so we can minimize the amount of traffic because we expect a, a good crowd and a, and a really fun event. If you haven't gotten a ticket, they're still available. Uh, tickets will be available uh, online um, and, uh, and there will be some more information for people who have signed up uh, as we are always looking and tweaking the health protocols that we have in place right now with everything going on um, in the state. So we look forward to that. Um, and with that, I'm gonna uh, send the meeting quickly back to Mike uh, Waller to sort of adjourn the business part before we get to our guest speaker. Thank you, Kevin, and also to Linda uh, and Steve. Um, and this concludes the, the business part of the meeting and back to Kevin for the remainder of the meeting. Thank you, Mike. So tonight well, um, we have a, a, a very uh, a wonderful speaker that we think uh, well, will bring a lot to our, our program. Um, it's a little bit out of the box you would think, uh, but not necessarily because uh, we're all in this world, uh, in the world we call the arts. Um, so uh, I'd like to introduce our speaker, um, uh, described by the New York Times as a conductor who radiates enthusiasm and from the Los Angeles Times is a real grabber. Chung Ho Pak is known for his unique vision of the role of classical music. Since 2007, he has been artistic director and conductor of the Cape Symphony, one of the largest orchestras in New England region. Mr. Pak is also artistic advisor and conductor of the Fremont Symphony. Previously, he has been artistic director and conductor of Orchestra Nova, the New Haven Symphony Orchestra, and the San Diego Symphony, which Mr. Park guided through bankruptcy to the unprecedented financial success. As a nationally recognized educator, he served as music director with the University of Southern California Symphony and the San Francisco Conservatory of Music uh, Orchestra, as well as director of orchestras and music director of the World Youth Symphony Orchestra at Interlochen Center for the Arts, the principal conductor of the Emmy nominated Disney Young Musician Symphony, music director of the debut orchestra, the Colburn Chamber Orchestra, and the Diablo Ballet. Guest conducting has taken him over to Europe, Russia, South America, and Asia. Uh, Mr. Pak is also a frequent speaker on television and radio, including TED Talks and NPR uh, appearances, as well as a clinician and conductor at the National Music of, uh, Festivals. So tonight's program will be focused on the arts and entertainment during COVID finale or encore. A candid look at the future of the arts and entertainment. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my honor to introduce Chung Ho Pak. Thank you so much, Kevin. And it's such an honor to be here. Uh, as Kevin alluded, it might be a little unusual to have a conductor of an orchestra speak to a group of people who are interested in history. But of course, um, on the face of it, a symphony orchestra is about the history of fine art. But I'm also here to share with you the story about our future as well, and especially vis-a-vis -vis our current circumstances. So I hope that this will be interesting. I'm gonna to try to be as um, concise and as um, being a conductor, I'm used to making things flow during a concert. So I hope that to leave enough time for you to ask questions as well. So I'm going to share my screen at this point and I'll start with, uh, let's see my desktop, I suppose, or Microsoft. I'm going to 
begin with my PowerPoint here. Okay, great. So ladies and gentlemen, as Mike said, um, my topic is gonna be arts and entertainment, but you can really replace almost any business today because we all are facing very similar challenges during this time of COVID, finale or encore. So I'm gonna to try to be as candid and as upfront with you as possible. I'm gonna to try to tear away the curtains or maybe the backstage curtain so you can see hear a little bit of what I'm thinking about, what my organization is thinking about, what the arts are thinking about, and perhaps again, what every business is thinking about at this time. So this is a perfect challenge, a perfect storm. We have COVID, but even before COVID, we had technology and social trends, which were really changing the way the consumer was behaving. And then we also had another challenge, which a very traditional industry, the performing arts and symphonies in particular, but perhaps all the performing arts. The model that we've been holding on to has been the model that has existed for the last, oh, I would say hundred years. But let's just take a look at COVID for just a second. All of us know about this social distancing. There's, it's a generally a vulnerable demographic, or at least it was, perhaps not so much now since many people who are older are vaccinated, but there is still fear and apprehension and uncertainty. Um, there's the issue of gathering, the proximity and dispersion of infection. And there's the desire from the organization to just break even financially. And now over, and, and, and this is exactly what we're doing right now, there's a broader acceptance of digital entertainment and interaction. So right now, you are not in my living room and I am not in yours. We, about a year and a half ago, all of this silliness of being in a Zoom meeting would have seemed like science fiction, but now it's our daily occurrence. How do we compete against that virtual reality? Well, before I get into that, one of the first questions I get is, you know, when do we return? And if you have been to uh, the Cape Symphony website, you'll know that we are returning actually last month. We gave two concerts, one concert at the Melody Tent and to almost a sold out audience. That was breathtaking to be in front of an audience of almost 17 or 1800 people in the round, the Melody Tent. We did open up the walls, so there was ventilation, but still to see that many people, and I haven't seen that many people or been in front of that many people in a year and a half, and they were cheering and there were was just so much emotion in the room as we returned. A few nights later, we gave a special performance at the Cape Playhouse uh, to help them on their benefit too. But our official opening night will be September, middle of September, and our season is fully launched. If you go to capesymphony.org, you'll, you'll see it all there. You can even download a brochure. It's a beautiful brochure. So where we are mentally, is we are prepared to come back in September, but that doesn't mean that we're, we have you know, a tremendous amount of hubris or a sense of certainty. We're gonna be watching the CDC guidelines very carefully, and we're going to adhere to it, of course. We, are, uh, we wanna give, us people, uh, keep, keep, give our guests as much confidence as possible and still be able to accommodate our very large audiences. I'm sure I'll have some questions about that at the end of this presentation. But as I was alluding to, ladies and gentlemen, I don't think COVID is necessarily the real problem. People will point to it and have pointed to it as, as being the greatest challenge, but I don't think so. Before COVID, attendance for the arts across the world had been flat or declining. The demographic, the demographic of the audience had been fairly consistent, especially in this country. The market had not been growing, so it's generally an, an older audience. And that's something that we, uh, we are very interested in broadening. The product and experience has remained fairly unchanged for the last 100 years, or even 150, or even 200 years. Uh, what we present are meat and potatoes of a symphony, but you can say the same thing about museums or, or ballet or opera, that the core repertoire is centuries old. But the business model has also been unchanged for 75 years, as I was saying, 75 to 100 years. It's still a nonprofit, rather bureaucratic, top-down model. It's kind of, I kind of liken it to the US auto industry in the 70s and 80s. Another, another 
uh, kind of red herring that people point to is technology. Ah, is technology the evil? Uh, is, is all of this digital entertainment the problem? So I'm here to give you some context. Well, yes, there is a new expectation by consumers. And now people, and I mean you, you are all consumers as I am. We want things free. We wanna go on YouTube and see things for free. We want instant gratification. We wanna hear our music now on our iPhone, in our car, on our computer. We want it now. We are not, we're not very patient. We search for the extraordinary and sensational and that goes without saying. I think YouTube automatically tees up what is the most fascinating, what are the most interesting. And our tastes are insatiable and inexhaustible. Let's admit it, many of us, maybe not all of you, but many of us are rather addicted to spending lots of time on YouTube. And we go down what we call rabbit holes, where we go from one YouTube to another and, and on and on and on. Before we know it, we spent hours days, weeks, months on content, on Netflix and series. There is no end to it. it probably, probably if you laid every new program on Netflix or Amazon or Hulu end to end, it would probably take us to the end of our days. And there's no loyalty, meaning that while we may have a sub subscription today, if someone came with a cheaper, more, more variety, uh, more accessibility, we would probably jump in a heartbeat. So that makes it very difficult for symphonies and, and fine arts to know that the consumer is very fickle. There's a generational divide. You have we baby boomers who, who love newspapers and post offices and antennas and libraries and concert halls and museums. These are things we grew up with. The Gen X generation had the cell phones and cable service, email, Facebook, YouTube, and Wi-Fi. And now today, the young people have really, and this is not even covering it at all, they have apps and Amazon and voice commands and TikTok and Twitter, Instagram and texting. Everything is becoming more and more um, uh, easy to, to, to act upon and quick to act upon. Now, uh, without getting into this paragraph, Totally. I want people to be comforted by the fact that technology and music and the arts have, it's a long time marriage. Ever since the first caveman picked up a rock and a stick and pounded them together and creating sound, that was technology. That, believe it or not, then animal skins and creating string instruments of, of, of different types um, all across the world. And then we graduated to um, plucked instruments and harpsichords and piano, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So to say that we should be frozen in time in the 19th century or 18th century, and that is all the symphony should be, would be denying thousands of years of technology of advancing of how human beings made sound. And then, of course, the printing press, just as it changed the written word, once we were able to notate how music was to be performed, well, that was the beginning of a complete explosion of other people being able to replicate music and become more complex because now you can write parts out. People didn't have to memorize only one note at a time. And you had uh, you know, choral groups and then small ensembles and then yes, the symphony and all of these people did not have to memorize the music. You can now read music. Here's another familiar piece of technology, Meltzel's metronome in the 19th century, and Beethoven was one of the first to adopt the metronome. Thank goodness, because now we as conductors can refer to this technological marvel to get an idea. As my music theory teacher used to say, if you're waiting for, for a phone call from Beethoven in terms of an interpretation, you have a long time to wait because he's not gonna tell you. But this little device can give me a glimpse into what Beethoven may have had in mind in terms of how fast a piece should be, particularly his symphonies. There's great controversy whether Beethoven's metronome was faulty somehow, but that's another story altogether. And again, uh, as instruments, even within the symphonic world, things became better and stronger, even though we kept playing Mozart and kept playing Beethoven, Violins became stronger. We went to, to metal wound strings, 
which could produce greater sound and they became bigger. So even within the seemingly um, frozen world of a symphony, tremendous advancements in technology. And then the reproduction, as I was saying before, from the gramophone to the radio, to television, to YouTube and Netflix, this idea of democratizing art. In the old days, you, you either heard art in, well, in the very old days, by showing up and seeing a human being play an instrument. That was the only way, or sing a song, that you can experience sound, uh, organized sound of music. But then the gramophone changed everything. And as long as you had a certain amount of money, then you could buy a gramophone and you could have the concert hall in your living room. We forget about that, that, that democratization of art. And then the radio, of course, that was less expensive and then more infinite. You didn't have, have, to have, have to have cylinders. You can now listen to multiple stations and hear everything from country to the news to classical music. And then television added that third dimension, which even became more addictive. And now today, YouTube, you don't have to have 12 channels as we did when we were growing up. Now it's infinite. And the first integration of technology into a concert was in a piece called Pines of Rome by Ottorino Respighi. Now I'm going to play this and I'm gonna hope that the sound, I'm gonna actually pause for just a moment. I'm gonna pause my, my share and I'm going to see if I can, I don't know if this is, um, let's see, I'm going to go back into this and I'm going to share once again to make sure the sound is, is audible. That's my goal. Okay, pause a second. Um, share sound and here we go to Safari. Good, very good. Here's Toscanini conducting the NBC Orchestra. And at the end of this clarinet solo, you're going to hear a recording of a bird. And this was the first use of an electronic work. I don't know if it was strictly electronic. It could have been a wound up, uh, but no, it was probably electrical. Uh, but it was a recording of a bird and not an actual bird in the concert hall. And what a magical moment that was. Here it comes. What a magical moment, even today, that is still haunting to hear. Totally unexpected. You can imagine the audience coming and just going, my goodness, where is that bird? Where is that coming from? So during the 1960s, I'm going to go back to my screen for the, um, I'm going to go back to my screen if I can. Let's see here, stop share, and then I'm going to share one more time. Thank you for your patience, everyone. Uh, doo -doo, doo -doo. Share screen to PowerPoint. Here we go. So during the 60s and 70s, there was an attempt for everyone to incorporate electronic music from everyone from John Cage to Pierre Boulez. So fine art moved beyond just acoustic instrument, but embracing technology as well. So we can't fear technology for without it, without understanding how essential it is to the success of art and entertainment. And our only choice is to figure out how to use it wisely uh, to keep the progression of the art form moving 
forward. We cannot define art based only on the past. As much as it might be tempting to, even myself, I long for the days of my earlier youth and upbringing and, and popular music. Uh, art must move, and, and it does move forward. So if technology and COVID are not the problems, then, and they're here to stay, and, and I don't mean COVID, I don't mean to sound so uh, uh, negative, but the idea of viruses and, and how viruses change our, the way that we interact. Where does this leave live performance? Where, where are theater companies and orchestras and opera companies gonna go? And if music experience is diminishing in value, what role does it have in our society today? And what I mean by that is that when we were waiting, if you got to this Zoom meeting today early, about a half hour early, you were listening to a recording of two guitarists playing the Bach concerto for, for double, uh, double violin, two violins. But we probably weren't listening to it. You were probably hearing it in the background. And that is the role that we, uh, radically music has changed in the last 150 years. As I was saying earlier, music was so precious. It was like a drink of water in a desert. You, you, it, was, it had so much value because you actually had to make an effort to see it. And now it's background music as we're waiting for our Zoom meeting to begin. So what, as, as music becomes more disposable or more um, uh, as, as background and for free, what role does live music have? Well, one of the reasons I think is human aspiration. Now, don't get me wrong. I, I love a good Big Mac as well as the next guy, but without the great works of art, Michelangelo, the Citizen Canes, the Kubricks, the Picassos, we just become consumers. We just take up more space. We don't leave anything other than perhaps our, our, our finances to our children and their children. What do we leave the world? How do we leave it better? Which is, I love the, the Chatham Historical Society because you're trying to leave a sense of context of history and understanding, a deeper appreciation of the Cape and its history. And that is why great art and great history must survive. It, but it, you know, it requires us to evolve with it. Uh, now, let me ch share one other thing and show you why I'm so nervous about the future of virtual reality. Okay, I'm gonna screen and let's go back to Safari and I'm going to share. Uh, this is my friend, Joshua Bell. And this is him performing in some club, not in a concert hall, but in a club. And this is a 360 degree video. All of you have been to YouTube, but there's more and more and more content of video being captured in the most unusual situations. Now, let me show you something. Here I am in front of Joshua Bell, and I'm gonna take my hand, and I'm going to move my cursor over, and I'm looking around at the rest of the room. And you could do this right now. Let me go back a little bit so you can hear a little bit more Joshua playing. And you can go anywhere in the world. You can go under the ocean. You can go to the moon. You can go inside of a football huddle. You can go anywhere you want. And it's just going to become more and more that way. So you're saying, well, Jung Ho, that'll never replace a live performance. For some of you, that may be the case. And I hope for many of you. But for a younger generation, people in their 20s and 30s, this is an acceptable uh, replacement. Just as I, you, you might remember, even before telephones were invented, you'd have to be fairly old to do that, or before your town got a telephone. But now we use telephones as a completely satisfactory way of communicating with everyone. Never mind a computer, never mind email, never mind Facebook, never mind all of that. Every generation has a different standard for interacting with each other and not being in the same room. Okay, go back to my little um, presentation here. 
And I, I hope you're having your questions in mind while uh, we're all coming to the home stretch here. Let's see, Microsoft PowerPoint and share. Okay, so that was a virtual, a virtual reality. And here's another reason why I, I, I like to call myself not a conductor, but I am a fighter. I am a warrior for maintaining the importance of us gathering together. Okay. I'm not just a conductor, but I'm a, I'm a warrior for community. If we were ever to survive in our living rooms and on Zoom channels, we would completely lose our sense of community. And, and maybe I don't even need to tell you what a tragedy that would be. You would not know your neighbor. You would not know the people on your street. You would not know the character of your town. You would lose a sense of what the Cape is all about or New England is all about. We will all live in little boxes. We cannot let that happen. If we let that happen, then we lose our empathy for each other. We lose our ability to care and to, be, and to love each other. And then we lose our, our will to make an effort. We, if everything showed up on an Uber Eats app and our pizza came to us every night, we would stop being human beings and we would be kept, kept animals. And we do not want to do that. So we must continue to gather together. We must be together, see each other, feel each other. Now, one of the things that makes people a little bit nervous is the word entertainment, because arts and entertainment. And I, want, I just want to say a few words about this, and I'll be quick about this. But, you know, the word entertainment and how it's applied to fine art is something that is really only a recent phenomenon. Because Mozart and Beethoven, two of the greatest classical composers, understood the economics of art. You know, we think of art as being free of the, the travails and the burden of having to make money. But Mozart and Beethoven were entrepreneurs. You could see the way they put on concerts and every decision they made, they wanted to excite the audience. Beethoven kept rather fastidious notes of his expenses. He was his own entrepreneur. He produced his own concerts, one of the very first. Up to that point, composers were court composers. They were basically employees. Beethoven and Haydn were part of this new generation of composers who were entrepreneurs. So I just want people to think, to remember that some of the greatest artists that we think of as art were also business people as well. They understood the value of entertainment. Thank you for listening to that. Now, let me get back to why I think we need to have live performance. And I believe almost first and foremost, we have a moral imperative. We have the cure. If I was Jonas Salk and I, and I had the cure for polio, I believe it would be a crime to withhold that from the world or to char charge some exorbitant fee that some child who could not afford the vaccine could get it. That would be immoral. And so I feel that we, for all the reasons I just shared with you, that we have a moral imperative to help make the world a better place. If, if classical music and symphonic music, pops music, Gershwin, Beatles, Lady Gaga, if we bring joy and hope to a world, then we have a moral imperative, just as Jonas Salk did, to help heal the world. And that's, what I, that's why I get up in the morning and that's why I'm with the Cape Symphony. We believe that every child, every person deserves food, clean water and shelter. And, but we also know that the cure for loneliness is beauty and emotion and companionship and expression and love is the answer. And I believe that's why a concert is so important. Okay, I'm gonna go past this. You know, guys, a symphony is a fabulous metaphor of how a symphony can, a society can be. I love it because it's the very, one of the few places that you can come to a concert and look around and you cannot guess which, who is a liberal or who is a conservative, who's a Democrat and who's a Republican. We are all together, not, not only in the audience, but on stage as well. Look at this picture of the Cape Symphony. I want you to point a finger to tell me which one is a Democrat and a Republican. And we do have both. It is where 70 people get together on stage and do something incredibly beautiful, incredibly emotional. And we just 
are, are celebrating our togetherness. And that, that's another reason why I think symphonies need to exist is that they remind us of how, how universal we all are together. And so the, the part of the reason I'm, I'm sort of radical in my thinking is that I've decided to ask all the hard questions. And there's a book that was written many years ago called He's Just Not That Into You. And it's a little sexist because of the title. But the idea was that if you're not getting something that you want, that you need to ask yourself or, or, or just realize that if, if the world isn't beating a path to your door, maybe it's you that need to evolve. And this is what I have come to a realization that for a long time, people said, oh, classical music is not, it's not as popular as when I was younger. And it's true. There's, there's, PBS doesn't pro, you know, broadcast orchestras anymore that used to, but not anymore. Fewer classical stations. Music is being taught less in the schools. But instead of complaining about it, which I get a lot of complaints, I think it's time for us to evolve. And the Cape Symphony has been my laboratory for that. It has been my laboratory to see what can we, can we be something for, for everyone, not the 1%, not the 0.5%, but can we actually become a symphony for the 99.5%? Can we present concerts that are exciting and emotional? Can we have great customer service? Can we tell a story during these concerts? Can we integrate technology in a way that doesn't denigrate the core product, but actually enhance it? in the way that, that steel strings enhance a violin. And so this has been my journey that I'm sharing with you, this, this, this road to discovery. And what I just said, you know, if we do not evolve, if we decide that we're going to be kept in an in a air-sealed bag for the next 200 years and keep Mozart and Beethoven hermetically sealed, then we dishonor them because Mozart was an incredible radical. The way the operas that he wrote were so unheard of. And the, the themes and the music and Beethoven was more like perhaps, a, a, you know, a, a, like a, a heavy metal music at the time. So incredibly brave and unusual. And, and Stravinsky as well. If we stop progressing, then we dishonor these people who we love so much because they have stretched our imagination. We must continue to stretch the imagination for the next generation. And so I'm going to end my talk here and leave it open to, um, to uh, questions and your feedback, because I'm sure I stirred up a lot of, maybe a few hornet's nests as well, but that's a good thing, I think. But so in the end, we must capitalize on our best resource. At the Cape Symphony, this means being human. That's why I conduct with every fiber of my body and my soul, and why I try to draw that out from my musicians, that, that, that they feel like they can risk and that they're 17 years old again, and they remember why they got into music and why they love the orchestra so much. And I want you to feel it. I want you to feel 17 years old again. I want you to, to, to feel like you own this. And so that's, that's where I put all my eggs in that one basket of getting more emotion, more joy. That's our mission statement, to inspire joy, not to preserve classical music, not to, um, not to please the 0.5%, but to be as human as possible. And that has paid off handsomely because the CAPE has embraced this more than any other community I've ever had the pleasure of working with. We have three times the audience three times the size of an audience per capita than any other orchestra I know. We give twice the amount of concerts. We give twice the amount, the amount of classical concerts in a very large hall and we sell them out. And we hope to do so as we come back as well. It may take some while to get people confident again, but I know we'll come back quickly. We give three times the amount of POPs programs. So the secret sauce is really you. You are the inspiration behind why I do this. You are the people buying the tickets and coming seeing the symphony and making it the best night out. So I really have you to thank. And I'm going to uh, close with this one more video I wanted to share with you about the, the, the why I am so motivated to be um, more human. Okay, here we go. I'm going to share this one last video with you. 
This is Asimo. Uh, I think he's made by Honda. And every year they bring him out to do something more, something more and more extraordinary. Uh, and this is a very old video, so you can imagine how sophisticated Asimo is now. But I just want to let you know that even I can be replaced. <laughs> and I'm determined not to be replaced. I'm determined to be as human and as emotional and share that with you for years to come. All right, thank you so much. I'm, I'm happy to take any questions or any feedback. Zhang Ho, thank you very much. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, John, our, our assistant, is going to be looking at his questions. I'll kick it off for everybody. If anybody's shy in this, um, you're obviously very passionate about what you do. Uh, and if you could look in a crystal ball, um, where do you see the next 10, 15 years? Are you hopeful? I am hopeful if we as an industry see the writing on the wall. Uh, you know, the analogy I make is to global warming, that it takes uh, almost a catastrophe for people to move and to act and, and, and take action. And I feel like if we as artists can not see ourselves as being a rarefied exception to, to society, but there, there is need more than just beauty of the art we produce. Again, there is need for humanity and empathy in our society. We need to come together and we need to remember what binds us together. And if, if we can embrace this, Kevin, as our main mission and not just to put paint on a canvas or note through a violin, then we will have stepped up and taken the higher mantle. We will, we will have taken the higher purpose and I think this could possibly be a new era for, for the purpose of art. Thanks. Thank you. John, do we have any questions out there? Or? No questions yet. So oh. I really encourage folks to yeah. um, reach out and ask some questions. I have a question. Don't, for you. don't be shy. Yeah. Feel free to write the questions in. I have a question. Or, for or, you. Just, or, or even just a comment. Uh, yeah, comment is comments. Yep. Uh, well, Jung Ho, I have a question for you. This is kind of off an earlier conversation we had in our, one of our run throughs was talking about how do we connect the Cape Cod cultural institutions? And what do you, what is your thoughts on that? It was just one of the things that when I got to talk with Kevin and John uh, a, a bit more and, and discovered the Chatham Historical Society and the campus that you have, I felt almost ashamed that I had been conductor with the Cape Symphony for 15 years and I had never set foot on your campus. And it just reminds me how much wonderful work and how much great leadership there is in the community, but how fragmented we are. And so I, uh, I am determined to find out whether we can create what I'm calling this kind of neural network of creativity uh, and of consciousness that we can come together and collaborate together. So that Symphony and maybe the Chatham Historical Society and other arts groups can come together and actually do something that that forces us to, to be on each other's territory, to, to get in front of each other's audiences and, and to be stronger because of that. Uh, I think we live in our little fiefdoms a little bit too much and I'm hoping that we can, uh, at, we've opened the door for us to, to work together in the future, but I, I think there's so much more to do. We have one question now, it's a pretty good one. It says, what can we of the older generation do to help encourage the younger generation to embrace the arts? Yes, I get that question asked a lot, a lot. And what I would, what I would say 
is just to bring them, just bring them to one. And I think, and that's, that seems like such an obvious uh, thing that bring them, bring them to just one concert. But I think many of us, especially who are older, think twice and three times about bringing someone younger because we ask ourselves, the first question is, will they be patient enough to stay through a concert? Will they, can they sit through an hour concert, two hour concert? And, 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 and you know, would it be the right fit? And I want everyone to hear me now that I'm not interested only in leading a horse to water. I'm interested in having them come back and back and back. And when I put together a concert, ladies and gentlemen, I put them together for that person that you have invited. And it doesn't have to be a young person. It could be the neighbor to your left, or could that be that person that you meet at the post office and they've never been to a symphony or they think they've been to a symphony and it's not their cup of tea, but they're willing to give, they're willing to trust you. They're willing to trust you. And so then you bring them. And I want you to know that I put that concert together just for them. I mean, I love you, but I am putting the concert for them. So whether they're 20 years old or whether it's seven years old or whether they're 87 years old, if they're coming to the symphony for the first time, I want to knock them out. I want, I'm gonna conduct with every, again, fiber of my being. I'm going to make them feel comfortable. Um, the program book that we give them, the choice of repertoire, all of these things will make the first time visitor feel very comfortable. And I think that's where people get a little scared about going to a ballet or going to a symphony for the first time. They're not sure when to applaud. They're not sure what the traditions are and it makes them feel uncomfortable. And I've tried very hard my entire career to remove all of those barriers. So if, if and I'll, I'll go one further. If you do inv invite your friend, please come backstage afterward and said, Jung Ho spoke to my group and said that I could bring my friend back and say hello. And I will, I'll come running out and I will shake your hand and I'll shake the hand of your friend and I'll, I'll make them feel very, very welcome. And, and so that's another thing that I can offer you as well. Hope that helps. Yes. So we have one comment and one question and they kind of, they kind of bookend each other. So the comment is from Jenny Nickerson. It's, she's saying, thank you for your thoughtfulness has touched me. We as Cape Codders have tried to embrace others who may not always have or share the same views, but we love the same thing. So thank you, thank you for saying all that, that you have been saying tonight. And then another question from Joanne Morrison says, what do you think accounts for this huge acceptance and response you've described in Cape audiences? And she says, besides your own talent and magnetism. Oh. And thank you for an intriguing <laughs> presentation. <laughs> That's a great question. And, and you know, it starts with me. I mean, I have a funny name, Jung Ho Pak, and people think, oh, you know, when did you come to this country, et cetera. I was born and raised in California. I grew up near the San Francisco Bay Area uh, in the San Mateo area. So I consider myself, uh, and I'm a child of television. Uh, I'm a, the television age and MTV as well. And so I believe I understand the average American very, very well. I, I try not to look at from a Eurocentric point of view. I try to create um, uh, uh, an experience. And then, and then I grew up in Silicon Valley as well. So I saw the rise of Apple computer and I saw the rise of Google and all, all of this, this you know, Tesla. And, and I was looking at the business, uh, you know, Southwest Airlines. I was going, all these entrepreneurs, all of these smart business people, and they're all understanding the, the, the inner workings of not only the consumer mind, but the human mind. And so, so John, what I try to do is I try to present a concert that would please me, an American. What would get me out of bed? And that's, it, would take, it takes a lot to get me out of bed because I'm, you know, like many of you, I'm, I'm very comfortable at home. I'm a cocooner, as we say, right? I love to stay home. I want things, I want Amazon to deliver things to me. I don't want to go out. What would get me out? So to answer that wonderful question, I try to put together a concert that's so buzzworthy, that's so radically full of joy that when people the next day go to church or go to the post office or, or tell their friends, they're saying, you won't believe what I just saw. And then that has been our number one. I, you know, we buy ads on the radio, we buy ads in the newspaper, but nothing compares to the buzz of someone who's truly excited. 
That's amazing. Thank you. Um, does folks have any other questions? Well, Chang Ho, I, I have to say this has been very enlightening, uh, a wonderful talk. Uh, I loved your point of view, um, uh, and, and I agree with you. I think it's important for there, there's got to be that connection between uh, the visual arts and the performing arts. Uh, and, uh, and, I, and I think we have a bright future uh, because of people like you. So thank you so much for uh, uh, gracing our screens uh, at our Zoom meeting today. And uh, uh, we greatly appreciate it. And for everybody who joined, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, please keep supporting the Cape Symphony and the Atwood Museum. We appreciate it. Amen. Thank you so much. Thanks for the invitation. Right. Take care, everybody. See you soon.